Okay, so these are uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms derived from uh, paraganglia composed of uh, chief and sustentacular cells arranged in a characteristic, characteristic, characteristic pattern, otherwise known as uh, Zellbahn. Uh, they're of neural crest origin. All right, the correct terminology for these tumors is uh, based on their location. So we have uh, glomus tympanicum, carotid body tumors, uh, glomus vagale, and then the uh, jugular foramen uh, paraganglioma. Um, it's the most common uh, tumor of the jugular foramen. Uh, it's followed by schwannomas and meningiomas. Uh, they've been linked to uh, genetic uh, syndromes like multiple endocrine neoplasia and von Hippen, Hippel Lindau disease. Um, incidence is uh, 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 100,000. Uh, they're slow growing at uh, 0.8 millimeters per year. And the uh, uh, median t tumor uh, doubling rate is about four to seven, thought to be about four to seven years, which is a uh, useful uh, fact to keep in mind when you're counseling these patients. Peak age is, is uh, 40 to 50 years of age. Uh, females are more commonly affected than males. 70% of them are sporadic, uh, and then 30% are familial. Males are more com commonly affected in the uh, familial type. They're inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. Uh, the inherited forms tend to be multicentric, bilateral, and earlier at uh, presentation of symptoms. Uh, there are four uh, uh, paraganglioma tumor syndromes that have been identified. That's PGL one through four, and uh, it's all depending on the subunit of the succinate dehydrogenase coding gene that's uh, uh, mutated in those. Presenting symptoms are generally postile tinnitus, uh, and the presenting sign is a middle ear mass uh, in uh, greater than 90% of the time in both of those cases. Uh, they, they can be classified according to the uh, FISH uh, classification. Uh, the uh, jugular uh, frame and paragangliomas are generally the type C and type D uh, tumors. The A and B tumors are your um, uh, uh, glomus tympanicum uh, tumors. <clears throat> That's uh, classification is further uh, um, subclassified uh, by a SANAS group. Um, they, they break out the uh, uh, type C and type D. Uh, classifications uh, uh, further. Uh, management options for these patients are observation, uh, radiation with uh, fractionated external beam radiation or radiosurgery, uh, microsurgery or combinations of those, uh, those uh, treatments. So observation is uh, generally considered uh, when we have older patients or patients with other comorbidities. Uh, Carlson and his group uh, had a group of uh, patients that they observed over seven years. It was uh, 16 patients, and what they found was that five patients, or 42 percent of those uh, patients, had uh, their tumors grew, um, uh, and then uh, close to 60 percent remained stable. So that's important to keep, keep in mind. 30 percent of them uh, developed new cranial nerve deficits. Radiation uh, is uh, used primarily in the setting of bilateral tumors. Um, or unilateral, unilateral tumors with a contralateral neuropathy, elderly patients and patients with com comorbidities. Uh, results have been pretty good uh, with radiation. Uh, Hui in 2009 uh, 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 published their results with uh, radiotherapy, uh, five weeks of radiotherapy, stero stereotactic radiosurgery, single fraction results were uh, published by the Mayo Clinic. Uh, 2004, and I'm sure they've had other publications since then, but at that time they uh, had 75% control of their tumors. A recent meta-analysis meta compared surgery and radiation, and a stereotactic radiosurgery according to this meta-analysis meta had 95% con control rate. Uh, but we can't forget the um, complications that can occur from uh, radiation, especially fractionated external beam radiation which is sometimes indicated in these uh, tumors based on the size of the lesion. So we can have necrosis of the skull base, osteonecrosis of the external artery canal, which can be very troubling for these patients. Uh, reduction of salivary production, brainstem necrosis, uh, radiation-induced stenosis of the internal carotid artery, uh, secondary malignancy, uh, dysphagia, aspiration, these things, these things all can occur. So we should consider uh, microsurgery in younger patients uh, patients with secreting tumors, when there's a concern for malignancy, if radiation is contraindicated, or they've had radiation and uh, it's, it's uh, no longer offered. 
Um, in general, when we consider these tumors, I think it's wishful thinking to expect like lifelong uh, success with inactivity. So eventually, they're probably going to grow at some point. Uh, so our microsurgical options are the infratemporal fossil approach, which was developed by Fish in 1978. Uh, the, uh, that can be done with full rerouting of the facial nerve or uh, partial rerouting, which is my preference, uh, which uh, generally has a better uh, facial nerve outcome, in my opinion. Uh, it can, we, there are options uh, for uh, hearing preservation. We can consider the fallopian bridge technique, which was developed by Penzac and Jackler, uh, where the facial nerve is not moved at all. It's just we just barber pull it and keep it in place. Uh, mastoid neck uh, technique with partial re rerouting of the facial nerve basically is uh, mastoidectomy uh, work in the neck and then I uh, develop uh, decompress the facial nerve in its vertical segment and then elevate it out of the that portion of the fallopian canal and then remove the tumor and then there's the juxta condylar approach which was developed by George and, and Fukushima which ob obviates the need for transposition of the facial nerve uh, totally uh, it's similar to like a, a far lateral approach. It's got a, a low-lying craniotomy posterior to the mastoid. So in preparation for surgery, we have to uh, remember things like uh, the possibility that the patient might, might want autologous blood transfusion, embolization two days prior to the uh, operation. And it's important to uh, test the patients uh, to see if they have a secreting tumor um, and to uh, uh, assess your need for uh, perioperative uh, medical blockage or alpha blockade. <clears throat> Um, the uh, infratemporal fossa approach is uh, generally done through a wide uh, C-shaped incision with an extension into a skin crease in the neck. Um, the uh, flap is developed, the ear canal is transected and closed. Uh, and then <clears throat> you, uh, at that point you can do uh, the neck work or you can proceed with the temporal bone work. In this uh, picture you can see um, they've transposed the, uh, the facial nerve anteriorly uh, onto the uh, parotid gland. Um, the uh, next move is to, uh, once you have the, the blood vessels isolated in the neck, the next move is to extraluminally extra uh, occlude the uh, sigmoid sinus and then uh, ligate the uh, jugular vein in the neck and then uh, remove the tumor uh, from, uh, basically we do it from an inferior to a superior, in an inferior to superior direction. Uh, the fallopian bridge technique is a, another technique that I mentioned um, where the, you can preserve, uh, you can use it in the absence of uh, with or without closure of the extra auditory canal. If you're going to preserve hearing uh, with this approach, um, it's important to take into consideration uh, the ear canal and the tip of flap and the acicular chain at the beginning of the procedure. Um, when you, as you develop your flap, uh, you can't just go ahead and transect the extra auditory canal. You have to uh, create your vascular strip incision in, in the ear canal. Uh, it's a, the skin that lines the posterior aspect of the extra auditory canal. Has, you have to make incisions in that area. You have to develop that uh, vascular strip uh, initially, and then you can go ahead and turn your flap forward. Um, the resection is done. In the process of that, you'll lift the eardrum up. That's called elevating the tip on the flap. Sometimes the ossicles are involved. Uh, occasionally, we'll do a secular chain reconstruction um, if, uh, the, if the ossicles are involved. Uh, but at the end of the case, it's uh, particularly, it can be, it's, it's somewhat difficult, um, but it's important to remember uh, the, to reposition that vascular strip properly um, because if it, it does not, um, if it's not properly repositioned in the external auditory canal, it can drop into the mastoid and form a uh, cholesteatoma and get infected and that can be a problem. So uh, what I've started doing is uh, repositioning the vascular strip in the extra auditory canal and um, uh, by uh, drilling a couple of small holes there with a one diamond burr and then feeding a, uh, a vicral suture uh, at the base of the vascular strip and then tightening that down at the, uh, you know, in the process of closing the wound. <clears throat> that seems to work well. Um, the, uh, another important uh, point uh, in, as far as tumor removal um, is when you're doing your decompression or your mastoid work, it's important to drill posterior inferior to the, uh, to the jugular bulb uh, towards the occipital condyle. It really uh, increases the exposure of the tumor and helps with that tumor removal. Uh, we can't forget to op open the sigmoid sinus, remove the tumor from that area uh, in the process of tumor removal. 
Um, <clears throat> the uh, intrajugular sheath is a key uh, landmark. Um, the, it's um, fibrous tissue that lies uh, 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 in, in the middle of the, uh, the two uh, portions of the jugular frame in the pars venosa and the pars uh, uh, nervosa. But uh, the key point here is that the tumors that lie lateral to that sheath um, have a favorable, uh, neuro, have, are, are more favorable for neural preservation uh, when, you, when you're going for a total tumor removal. And tumors medial to that sheath, uh, if you go for total tumor removal, it's more likely that you're going to cause some type of lower cranial nerve uh, deficit. When we have uh, tumors with intracranial components, um, your options are <clears throat> uh, you could do a single stage operation or you can do it in two stages. Uh, my preference is to go for a two stage operation where you do the, the infratemporal fossa approach type A first and then later return to the operating room for a retrosigmoid or translabyrinthine, uh, um, sorry, generally a ret retrosigmoid at the approach at that point. Um, this is done to uh, lower your risk of cerebrospinal fluid leak. So the risks of surgery are facial paralysis, aspiration, dysphagia, um, meningitis, uh, transient uh, CSF leak, hematoma infection. Generally, the surgery is pretty well tolerated. Um, the Asana's group uh, in 2016 presented their results for us to, out of 184 and for temporal fossa approaches, they, they did uh, with some variations. They were able to achieve 89% gross total removal, and the recurrence rate was uh, 2%. Um, they have a very uh, busy uh, center as far as this uh, type of surgery goes. The, the, uh, but there were a new or worsening cranial nerve deficits uh, in about a third of their patients, and in particular with the lower, uh, lower cranial nerves, um, 9, 10, 11, so on and so forth. Um, so it's one uh, reasonable thing to consider is just uh, subtotal resection. Um, and that's my preference when I think that the uh, tumors are heading medially, medial to that uh, inter um, that sheath in the jugular foramen. Uh, Juana uh, published his results with subtotal removal in 2014. Um, they had 12 patients w where they used that uh, uh, procedure, and there were no uh, cranial neuropathies. Um, and with approximately four years of uh, follow-up, um, what they found was that um, if, remaining if the remaining tumor volume was uh, less than 20% of the preoperative volume, uh, no tumor growth occurred at four years. Um, and that's uh, generally been, so far, has been my experience as well. Um, I'm not always doing a subtotal removal. I will go for a, 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 a total removal if the uh, tumor is lateral in the jugular foramen. <clears throat> so, in uh, closing, a case, uh, this is a 41-year-old uh, female uh, with a, uh, a left jugular foramen, uh, periglioma, 1.8 uh, centimeters. Her initial symptoms were uh, distorted hearing and left pulse dial tinnitus. Um, physical exam showed a red mass in her hypotympanum on the uh, left side, and all of her cranial nerves were intact. Uh, we, um, here's her uh, preoperative Im imaging, it's a relatively small tumor, uh, just located um, in, the, uh, in the jugular foramen on the uh, left side with a little uh, ball of tissue creeping up into your hypotympanum there. You can see it at the left external artery canal. <clears throat> the, uh, the patient, uh, we reviewed all her options um, because of her young age. Uh, she went for surgery. She underwent uh, preoperative uh, embolization with Onyx without uh, complication. You can see the tumor blush on the uh, left side of the screen. All right, there, and then embolization, and then loss of that blush. Uh, it was, I find that we, we've still, we're still using Onyx, but, um, and we're having, uh, having good results with it, uh, minimizing uh, complications. Here's her uh, neck dissection. Um, we, I do work with our head, my head and neck uh, colleagues on this, but um, we, we have isolation of the uh, jugular vein in the neck um, on the upper uh, right hand. Uh, sorry, upper, upper left-hand uh, pitcher there, and then uh, cranial nerves in the lower um, uh, right-hand pitcher. So uh, we uh, utilize a uh, infratemporal fossa approach, hearing preservation, um, and uh, we're able to preserve for external auditory canal. Um, and uh, basically, it's just a series of pictures uh, from her mastoid work. Um, you, uh, you basically, it, this is a, uh, her left ear, um, external auditory canal is here, uh, the uh, uh, facial nervous here. Um, 
the uh, and seen better in this picture right there. Uh, here's our tumor um, after it's the nerve's been partially routed out of the uh, fallopian canal. Uh, so in conclusion, assessment and management of uh, the jugular frame and periglioma is, is a demanding task. Uh, it's a complex anatomic relationship at the skull base. Um, the ideal treatment is uh, gr gross total removal, and, and, but that's not always possible, and there, it's associated with some significant morbidity. But so we should uh, treatment should be instituted that minimizes uh, morbidity, and uh, I, I still am in favor of uh, considering surgery in younger patients. Uh, we go for total removal without uh, cranial nerve deficits um, in laterally based uh, tumors. If it's not laterally located, uh, we consider a subtotal removal. Uh, thank you.